so much for uh, inviting me. Uh, I'm sorry that I have to give this talk in English. I hope that you will forgive me. Also, I noticed uh, on the poster, there's a picture of me that you won't recognize as me <laughs> because it was 30 years old. So anyway, this is what happens after 30 years. Okay, so uh, today I would like to uh, talk about Anadolubius in the context of <clears throat> some questions that a student asked me when I was privileged to take part uh, or to visit the excavations in Chorak Yela uh, last, the end of last summer. <clears throat> I was uh, very happy and honored to be a part of the research team that published the paper on uh, Anadolubius in August. And uh, the student asked me a lot of questions and it inspired me to create a presentation based on those questions. Uh, Adam Deluvius is a very important fossil that uh, has received a lot of attention in the media in Turkey, but what is Adam Deluvius? Why is it important? A student recently asked me these questions and so I hope to share the answers with you. And which button did you do? Yes, okay. So these are the questions that she asked me, but first, let's see, is there a pointer? Uh, this is a re recent uh, reconstruction of Adam Deluvius that uh, Isla just showed me this morning, and I decided to put it in the presentation. This is the actual face. This is a terrible, we agree, this is a terrible reconstruction. So don't use this if you find it online. Uh, but still, I mean, it looks like an ape skull, so, or an ape face, so I put it up there. This is the original, and we hope to do a reconstruction, a, a better reconstruction in the future. So what is Anna Delubius? That's the first question that we need to ask. Uh, what came before Anna Delubius? That's what this student asked me, and so uh, I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, why is Anadolubius important? Why, why should we care outside of Turkey? Because it's, a, it, it, it's an interesting fossil here, but it's actually very important globally. It's very important in terms of the bigger picture of ape and human evolution. And then surprisingly, she asked me, why did we become bipedal? And that we, we have some hints with the fossils of Anadolubius to answer that question as well. Why did hominines, the African apes and humans, of which Anadolubius is, is a member, why did they move from the Eastern Mediterranean, Western Asia region into Africa? We'll look at that question. And then this is just a question of my own to help wrap things up and provide some context. Um, why do we even study Miocene apes and what does it tell us about human evolution? Okay, so what is Anna Delubius? Well, this is more of a where is Anna Delubius uh, answer first. So this is, of course, uh, Anatolia and the uh, Eastern Mediterranean. These are the sites that are most relevant to what we're going to be talking about today. Um, I'm gonna be speaking a lot about the Balkans this is a site in Bulgaria called Asmata, and there are several sites, it's a little bit cut off here, in, in Greece, in northern Greece, Ravandrapi and Tsirokori uh, in northern Greece, Nikiti also, and then <coughs> Kyrgos Vasilisis in southern Greece, uh, just within the city limits of, of Athens. These are all uh, sites where we found things like Oronopithecus and Grapopithecus that I'll be talking about, which are closely related to Anadolubius. And then of course, uh, within uh, Anatolia and more broadly within uh, uh, this, this whole peninsula 
area between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. We have multiple eight localities, it's very rich. These are only the ones from the late Miocene, but there are older ones from, from Turkey in particular as well. And this site called Udamno is in Georgia, uh, close to the border with Turkey, but uh, still in Georgia. It's, a, it's more like the European apes that I'll be chatting about uh, soon. Uh, this is uh, Manage, which is in Iran, also again, not too far from the border with Turkey. Um, and it's, it's a different kind of, of ape, not specifically related to the things that we'll be talking about today. Uh, Sinat is, is a well-known locality, it, not too far from uh, Charapiala, actually in central Anatolia, but it has an ape that is more related to orangutans and not to African apes and humans. But it's just to illustrate that here in, in this area of the world, over the, over the period from 16 million years ago to 8 million years ago, 9 million years ago or so, many, many different waves of different kinds of apes came through this region which is what makes it so interesting for us as paleoanthropologists and so important to study in more detail. So of course, the main focus is Trorat uh, this site uh, in Chankara, so just not too far from here, uh, where there's a spectacular uh, assemblage of fossils beautifully, beautifully preserved fossils, including some wonderfully preserved uh, eight fossils. So that's the where, now the what. What is Anadolubius? Um, well, just to give a quick list, Anadolubius is about 8.7 8 million years old, as far as we can tell today. The dating is based on the animals that are found in association with it. We would like to be more precise on the dating, uh, and hopefully in the future, we will be able to find other ways of dating the locality uh, with greater precision. <clears throat> it is, as I mentioned, in Charak Yala, uh, near, basically, I think, within the city limits of Tonka. What kind of place was it 8.7 million years ago? It was a dry forest, a savanna, a savanna forested environment, not a total grassland and not a forest, but a mixture of the two. So a dry area with trees, but also with grassy areas. Um, a place that if you were to see a photograph of it today, or if you were to take a time machine and go back there and look at it, and you knew what happened in your own lifetime here, you would, you would think you were in Africa. You would think that you were in a savanna woodland setting in Africa with antelopes and giraffes and hyenas and zebras and elephants and all those things that we associate with Africa. But all those things lived here uh, in Turkey um, nine million years ago, but also in Greece and in Iran and in the entire Eastern Mediterranean, Western, Southwestern Asia area at the time. And in fact, all of these animals originate here, or many of them do, and migrate into Africa later on. And we'll talk a little bit about that towards the end of this talk. Uh, Anadolubius is probably a close relative of Oranopithecus. That's certainly the results of our analysis. We still need more information about Anadolubius to be more precise about exactly where to place it, but for now we know that it's a relation or it's a relative of Oranopithecus. And based on its jaws and its teeth, we know that it was a hard, tough object eater. In other words, it ate, it, it had powerful jaws, <coughs> excuse me, able to crush down and crunch down on, on, uh, oh, thank you, <laughs> on, uh, hard and, and difficult objects to break through, unlike the, the foods that many other primates eat where they, they just can't penetrate those external barriers. Um, and we presume that it was terrestrial because of its size and its presumed diet. 
but unfortunately we don't have any limb bones, any arms or legs that we can use to directly tell us exactly how it moved. Although we do have a few little pieces that might help us in the future. Okay, so uh, what came before Anadolupius is one of the questions that this bright young student asked me. So this is a big picture of, of ape evolution. This is uh, something very close to what we published in our article. There are some slight changes. Um, Kenbo, Kenbo was a, an early ape, uh, barely ape in many attributes, but we could still tell that it was an ape, and I'll say a little bit why we think that. But it's from the early Miocene of Africa, most of it is known from about 18 million years ago. The Kembo gave rise to a large, diverse group of <clears throat> fossil apes living in Kenya, uh, but also in uh, Europe and Anatolia. And it's from this large group, I'll talk a little bit about, that we have two, the two main branches of the living apes, the living great apes. The orangutans, which follow this route here, and eventually lead to orangs, pongo, the genus pongo, through a bunch of uh, fossil taxa, and I won't really be talking about them because we're gonna focus on Anadolupius, which is, as you can see, uh, pointed out here, uh, in this other group, this greenish group, that are the hominines. The hominines are the African apes and apes. So Anadolubius is a member of the hominines, and it's one of the two lineages that branch off from this group in the middle Miocene, that group having evolved from the chemo. And I'll show you a little bit about more of these in a minute. But that's where Anadolubius came from. It came from Africa. It definitely came from Africa. And it is descended from something that moved into a Eurasia. Oh, sorry, I didn't talk about this. In general, what we have are animals or apes that are monkey-like. That's what all of these guys are. They're monkey-like. They're on four limbs. They're, they're walking on the tops of branches. Their arms and their legs are equal in length, like a cat or a dog or a goat or, or a cow. Uh, a standard basic quadruped but arboreal, very adept in the trees, with, with tails as well. I oh, know, sorry, uh, it, these guys did not have tails. That's the difference from monkeys, is that they do not have tails. Um, we know enough about their brains to say that they were monkey-like in size, which means large compared to many mammals, but small compared with apes and with humans, certainly. Uh, and we also know a little bit about how, how they grew. And we know that they grew at same, the same rates and the same patterns that we see in monkeys. And we'll, over time, get this transformation in the, in the hominines, but also, of course, in the pongies, to ape-like bodies with larger ape-like brains and with ape-like patterns of growth. So I'll talk a little bit about all those things later on. So here's sort of a pictorial summary of the evolution of the apes that came before Anadolubius. So I mentioned Ikembo, a very generic, generalized ape, a soft fruit frugivore, it ate soft fruits, it wasn't capable of biting through and tearing through and, and extracting nourishment from really tough covered objects, fruits and roots and things like that, and nuts. Um, that lived for a long time, and we know a huge amount about the Kembo. It's extremely interesting. I've worked a lot on uh, the Kembo. We think that the Kembo evolved into something uh, like Afropithecus. Afropithecus is a little bit later in time, about 17 and a half. Kembo is mostly around 18 million years ago. Afropithecus is different from the Kembo in that it had very strongly built jaws and teeth. 
It could crush through, grind through almost anything that you give it. And it's very different from this uh, slender built Ikepo that could not exploit lots of food resources, especially food resources on the ground that tend to be harder to process. So Afropithecus was able to do that because of its massive jaws and teeth. And as a result, my theory, anyway, is that Afropithecus or something like Afropithecus was able to disperse north from the equator in, in Kenya, which is where it's found, north into uh, north of the Mediterranean. Because it was able to exploit a wide range of resources. So it didn't rely only on soft fruits that were in season. It could exploit a wider range of resources. Its, its range just naturally expanded until it found itself in Eurasia. And the, ear the earliest descendants of Afropithecus are very interestingly found in Turkey. And they are Agrippopithecus, which is found at these two sites in Turkey, in central Anatolia, Chandr and Pashalar. <clears throat> They're between 16 and 14 million years old. So these are the first apes that make it out of Africa at that time period. There are some others also in Germany and in Austria, which I'll show you in a minute. Uh, but uh, the biggest, the most important, the most informative samples actually come from these two sites here in Turkey. Um, now from these apes that lived in this time period, we will get uh, a subsequent evolution returning to a more chimpanzee-like form, more soft object, uh, soft fruit, uh, frugivory in things like Purolopithecus and Rudopithecus, which I'll come back to in a minute. But it's interesting that we go from these soft fruit, chimpanzee-like, you know, banana-eating, to these hard nutcracker animals that stay here, and then we go back to the sort of banana eating soft fruits. See that we get this going up and down in terms of soft fruits and hard fruits and soft fruits and hard objects throughout the course of actually ape and human evolution. So these are the ones that are the immediate ancestors of Anandaluvius. So these are the ones that lived in Western and Central Europe starting about 12 to 12 and a half million years ago. So this is a map that just illustrates what I was talking about. Uh, something like an Afropithecus disperses into, through Arabia, uh, into uh, Western Asia, Anatolia, and the Balkans, and then Europe. And these are the various localities in which Gricopithecus is found. Uh, Chandler, Hasselar, <coughs> and then two sites, one in Austria and, and one in Germany. And eventually, Gryphopithecus and Gryphopithecus like forms uh, thrive in Europe and they uh, evolve into a wide array of different kinds of more modern looking apes. And those are the Dryopithecines. So the Dryopithecines are the two, the two form, forms that I uh, mentioned before uh, Purolopithecus and Rudopithecus. But there are many, there are half a dozen or more uh, other kinds of apes that are found in this area from Spain to Central Europe to, uh, to the Pannonian Basin in, in Hungary uh, between 12 and about 10 million years ago. They're very, very successful. Um, they evolved modern ape attributes, suspensory positional behavior, or swinging below the branches instead of walking on the tops of branches, more upright posture, um, larger brains, all of that stuff seems to occur during the course of the evolution of the Dryopithecines over two and a half million years ago. But eventually they're forced out of Western and Central Europe. You know, uh, there are naturally occurring cycles of climate change, of course, today we're experiencing accelerated climate change due to our own activities, but climate change is a naturally occurring phenomenon. And 
at when the Dryopithecines first moved into Europe, Europe was a very lush, humid, subtropical environment that was very conducive, very nice for apes. But by about 10 million years ago, it was starting to dry up and the forests were giving way to grasslands. And the apes had to evolve. They moved south, trying to keep track of the grasslands, but as the grasslands continued to disappear, they had to evolve or they went extinct. And they evolved, I mean, some of them did anyway, most of them went extinct. Some of them evolved <coughs> into the great opithecines, of which Anadolubius is a part. We call them the great opithecines because the first genus that was named in the group is Gregopithecus, which was named in the 50s, I think. So a long, long time ago, the 1950s, so a long time ago. Um, so these very successful soft fruit chimpanzee-like fruitivores, they have to evolve or go extinct. They move into the Balkans and into Anatolia, where they evolve into something new. And this is what happens. Again, what came before Anadolubius is the question the student asked me. So Purolopithecus from Spain, uh, Rudopithecus from Hungary, these chimpanzee-like, suspensory, uh, modern ape-looking things, they evolved into something that was more like Australopithecines. Australopithecines are, of course, our ancestors from Africa, <clears throat> these early bipeds that had large jaws and large teeth and lived in more open country settings uh, and were bipedal. I'm not saying that these guys were bipedal. In fact, I'm pretty sure they were not. But in terms of their jaws and their teeth, they were Australopithecine-like. We think because of their ecology, they were more, they spent more time on the ground than do living chimpanzees, for example. So we think they were more terrestrial and they were hard object feeders. Again, they went back to that old tradition of being able to exploit a wide range of resources in open countries, roots, nuts, uh, fruit with very hard coverings, etc. that you need powerful jaws and teeth to break through. Um, so we have Purolopithecus, which is a little bit older, evolving into Rudopithecus. But then this other lineage here leads to Oranopithecus, uh, which is the oldest known member of this group from nine and a half million years ago in Greece. <clears throat> and then we have um, Anadolubius, which is almost a million years later, at 8.7 million years ago. Similar environments, although the environment in Anadolubius from which or in which Anadolubius lived might have been a little bit drier, that drying trend continuing. And then in between the two, excuse me, in between the two we have um, this specimen, there are two specimens actually, only two from this site called Nikidi in Greece, that's almost intermediate in age between Oranopithecus and Anadolubius. And anatomically, it's, it could be a transitional taxon. We need to work on that in more detail. Right now, the, this is uh, called Oranopithecus, but it's possible that it's an early Anadolubius, which would be really interesting, but we need to do more research on that, to be sure. <clears throat> so in this trend uh, of the hominines, hominines again being African apes and humans, um, we go from these more chip-like things to these more Australopithecine-like things, but that are widespread and successful and diverse. There are many, a number of different kinds. So it was a diverse strategy. And through time, as you go from Oranopithecus to Anadolupius, you get uh, some anatomical changes. Uh, the premolars, which are between the canines and the molars, get larger, the canines themselves get smaller, uh, the frontal bone, which is uh, more inclined in Oranopithecus, becomes more vertical. Maybe that's a sign of an increase in brain size, but we don't have enough of the brain, excuse me, the brain case yet to say. 
Um, and then there are changes in the front part of the jaw, also the premaxilla, that uh, make it look a little bit more modern than Oromo fingers. So we're, again, just to review, we're going from these forest living dryopithecines to these more open country grapevines. So that's what came before. Where did Anadolubius come from? The next question is, why do we even care about Anadolubius? Why is it important? Which is always an important, excellent question to ask. Why are we doing this? Well, Anadolubius and its relatives, including Oronopithecus and others, um, and its descendants, which we have yet to find, or at least identify in sufficient detail, they set the stage for the evolution of the African apes and humans, the modern lineage of African apes and humans. About a million and a half years after Anadolubius, we have Grecopithecus, that's the origin of the Grecopithecines term, because that's the taxon that was first named, that's why it's called Grecopithecines. I wish we could call them Anadolubians, I suppose, but we can't. We have to call them Grecopithecines because that was the first, Grecopithecines because that was the first one found. 7.2 million years. It has some attributes that make some people think that it might actually be on the human line. In particular, it has very small canines. But we only have this mandible and one other tooth right now, um, so it's hard to say what Grecopithecus really was. So how Lanthropus, if you know about human evolution, you know a little bit about Sahelanthropus. It's the earliest known uh, sample or taxon that many people would ascribe to the human lineage, a hominin. Um, it's from Chad and it's about seven million years old. There are some disagreement on what uh, Sahelanthropus really is, but there's a good chance that it's somewhere closely related to the origins of the hominids. And then, of course, we have much later in time, at four, close to four and a half million years ago, Ardipendicus raminus, which is universally, almost universally considered to be a hominin, that is to say, a member of our lineage after the divergence between humans and chimpanzees. Anadolubius and its relatives inform us about the evolution of all of these things. Uh, and I should say, of course, these are African, but this is from the Balkans. And it leaves open the question about where hominins may have first appeared. So, <clears throat> returning to a similar map that I showed you before, the descendants of Grecopithecines disperse into Africa uh, between seven and eight million years ago. Um, so the Dryopithecines disperse into the Balkans and Western Asia, and then subsequent to that, they disperse into Africa for exactly the same reasons. They were fleeing the drying climate of Central and Western Europe, uh, seeking refuge in this area, but as things got drier here, they moved further south towards the equator. So this is a summary. I've modified uh, this diagram from an Encyclopedia Britannica um, publication. Here's Anna Delubius at about 8.7 million years ago. <clears throat> and we have a, a number of different possibilities. So right now I've put it on the side branch. It's Anna Delubius is a relative of the common ancestor of gorillas, chimps, and humans. So it's our ancestors, ancestors, ancestor, in a sense. But it's also possible, and this is why we need to continue to work uh, at the Charocular and maybe find some, some new sites to give us some new fossils, because it's certainly possible, and there's some evidence to support the idea that it may not be a side branch, but it may actually be on the line 
just before the last common ancestor, the missing link between chimpanzees and humans. It's also possible that it's already on the line leading to gorillas. There's certain aspects of the anatomy of Adam Luvius uh, that remind us of gorillas. So we need more fossils to resolve this uncertainty, this question mark here. But it's certainly centrally placed as a critically important taxon, critically important species, to try to answer this question of what was our last common ancestor like. So that's why Anandaluvius is important. Now this uh, very inquisitive, very bright student also asked me, why did we become bipedal? And that sounds like a sort of a side question. What does that have to do with Anandaluvius? But it actually has a lot to do with Anandaluvius. Anandaluvius can help us to understand why we became bipedal. <clears throat> so we have, in terms of the different kinds of apes that were alive in this larger time period, we have Rudopithecus that I mentioned before, which is known from a lot of fling bones, so we have a good reconstruction. Also known from a lot of paleoecology. Um, then it was a suspensory ape. It swung below the branches, it moved below the branches. It was a soft fruit frugivore, as you can see here. You need figs and dates and things like that. Um, Danubius was a different kind of arboreal animal um, that was more bipedal. It had attributes of the knees, for example, to stabilize it so it could fully extend its legs, which Rudopithecus and other apes don't do. See how the legs are bent here, and here they're straight. That was a new kind of adaptation that we find in, in Danubius. Rudopithecus is from Hungary, Danubius is from Germany. And then we have Anadolubius. Now, th to be uh, completely honest, this is not a reconstruction of Anadolubius. We haven't uh, commissioned a reconstruction of Anadolubius. This is actually a reconstruction of Oranopithecus, but it serves our purposes here because they were similar. <clears throat> you can see large jaws. It's in a grassland area, but there are some trees. And it's uh, eating a terrestrial resource. It's eating a root that it got from the ground. So uh, it was a terrestrial quadruped, and perhaps a, perhaps a facultative biped. What do I mean by facultative biped? A, a, a biped, we are obligate bipeds. That means that that's the only thing that we can do. That's the only way we can move around, is bipedally on the ground. Um, but then you also have facultative bipeds, which are animals that are normally quadrupedal, like knuckle-walking chimpanzees, for example, but they're capable of walking on two legs. And the question is, was Anadoluvius like a chimpanzee that would occasionally go up on two legs, or was it a little bit more of a biped than a chimpanzee is, did it have some adaptations that helped it walking on two legs, which chips don't. Chips really are adapted to be quadrupeds, but they're capable of, of standing up on their two legs. I mean, you know, if you have a dog, you know, your dog jumps up and down on its hind limbs. A dog can actually hop on its hind limbs for a little bit. I wouldn't call it a facultative biped, but it can occasionally move on two limbs. Chimpanzees are better at moving uh, on two legs than a dog. I think Anadolubius might have been even better than a chip at that, but we need limb bones to test the hypothesis. But at any rate, what we do know about Anadolubius could tell us something about the origins of human bipedalism. <clears throat> this is an article that was very recently published, just last year. Uh, analyzing some chimpanzees from the Giza Valley Forest in Tanzania, so in East Africa, right? And this is a woodland savanna habitat that's probably similar to where Anadolubius lived. <clears throat> um, so trees, but grasslands also, rocky terrain, um, a mixture, a mosaic of environments, but 
definitely more open than what we associate a gorillas and many chimpanzees to live in today, which is more densely covered forests. This is a population of chimpanzees that live more in the open. And these are modern living chimpanzees. Um, so they live in this woodland savanna and they spend quite a bit of time on the ground. And this is just to very quickly go over some of the analysis that uh, Drummond Clark and, and colleagues um, uh, did. So they looked at the amount of time they as bipeds, so whenever they were bipedal, how much time did they spend on the ground and how much time did they spend in the trees? And they spent about 14% of the time being by when they were bipedal, 14% of the time was on the ground, 86% of the time was in the trees. That's kind of counterintuitive, right? I mean, you would think they're going to be bipedal, bipedal would be mostly on the ground. They're actually bipedal mostly in the trees. Uh, there isn't a huge difference, 5 and 9%, in terms of when they were bipedal on the ground, if they were foraging or if they were doing other activities, like rearing up and scaring another chimpanzee, for example, charging at a chimpanzee bipedally to impress them. That would be an other activity. Otherwise, they were foraging bipedally on the ground. You can understand why that's not... Um, extremely common because if you're on the ground, why would you stand up to forage when most of what you're foraging is on the ground? So you'd be mostly quadrupedal. Uh, that's why it's not hugely um, significant. And maybe other is more significant. But in the trees, when they're being bipedal in the trees, and remember, this is when they're bipedal. Most of the time they're quadrupedal. It's only she was only counting when they are bipedal. When they are bipedal in the trees, well, when they are bipedal, they are bipedal 86% of the time in the trees as opposed to 14% of the time on the ground. And they're almost always, or they're a huge percentage of the time, they're foraging. So that means that they're standing on a branch bipedally and they're reaching for food. They're grabbing food. Which is what you know we say Dan Uvius did that bipedal arboreal ape that we talked about before. <clears throat> but what's interesting for us who study Anadolubius is that this is an environment that's quite similar to what the, the environment in which Anadolubius lived might have been like. Um, Savannah woodland, more activities on the ground. Uh, having to move between separate patches of forest through open country could lead to selection for things like predator avoidance. There are lions and cheetahs and leopards and hyenas uh, on the ground that are ready to kill a little ape, which is relatively defenseless with small canines and no claws or anything like that. Um, predator avoidance, if you stand up bipedally, you can see further into the distance. Uh, but also, if you can see further into the distance, you can detect resources. You can find a tree that's fruiting, or you can find a water, a water source or something like that. Um, resource and offspring transport. If you're walking bipedally, your hands are not on the ground. And you can hold your babies, your little little apes, um, and you can also, of course, transport resources. So if you find something that is uh, nutritious and valuable in the open country where it might be a little dangerous, you grab it and then you bring it someplace else where you're safer, climbing up a tree, for example. <clears throat> and then there's also an argument about greater uh, efficiencies. And there are some studies that suggest that um, it's more efficient to walk over longer distances bipedally than quadrupedally. But this also depends on how well developed, uh, how well perfected your form of bipedalism is. 
Anyway, these are these are selective pressures, evolutionary pressures that might have favored the origin of bipedalism in this kind of an environment. And this is the kind of environment in which Anatolism is led. Uh, this is a reconstruction of, of Ardipithecus, which spent a lot of time in the trees, but was also a, a very good biped, fully erect biped, but with limb proportions that allowed it, and also a divergent big toe that allowed it to be quite adept in the trees. A little bit later on, when you get Australopithecus, they're more dedicated to living on the ground while still being able to um, climb into the trees. Was Anadolubius more like this? Or maybe the stage just before this? We need more fossils to be able to answer that question. OK, and then the last question that this bright, inquisitive student asked me was, why did hominines move from Turkey to Africa? So I, I've shown you this slide before. The dry up in the sense, these soft fruit chimpanzee-like herbivores, uh, enjoying the lush subtropical forests of Europe until they started to dry up. They moved into the uh, Mediterranean area, the southern Mediterranean, eastern Mediterranean, the Balkans, western Anat or Anatolia, uh, where they became more adapted to more open country settings, perhaps setting the stage for things like bipedalism. But eventually things got too dry for them there as well, and they had to move further south, tracking the tropics, or trapping the more humid environments into uh, closer to the equator and into Africa, where they eventually become the modern hominids. <coughs> Chimpanzees, gorillas, bonobos, and humans. <coughs> Why did hominids move from Turkey to Africa? This is a, a diagram from a, a publication that I was a, a part of from 2022, mainly written by my friend and colleague, Reverend Verma. Uh, <clears throat> this is a, a model that shows the relationship between north of the equator into the beyond the subtropics beyond the Tropic of, of Cancer, beyond 22 degrees or 23 degrees north latitude, the Pale Arctic um, zone, which, as I've mentioned several times now, had experienced increasing desiccation and loss of, loss of forest cover uh, to the, um, replaced by, by grasslands which uh, peaked at about 7 million years ago. So that had been starting, that had been going on for 13, since 13 million years, gradually getting drier and drier, forcing the dryopithecines out by 9, 10 million years ago, and eventually forcing the grypho, the, sorry, the grapopithecines south after 7 million years ago. And this, widespread dispersal occurring, not just of apes. If it was only apes, we could be skeptical. But it turns out that there are a lot of other animals that did the same thing. It's interesting, though, that so in this analysis that Madeleine did, um, she found that there were, there were cutoffs. All the way until about two and a half million years ago, there was almost no dispersal possible between uh, Eurasia and Africa because it was there was too much of a, a, a massive desert in North Africa and Arabia, especially in those two areas, and into Southwest um, Asia in, in, in particular, a little bit further east from here in Iran and places like that. Um, it was a barrier, but what that did, that barrier did, was it caused animals to evolve in their local environments. It's called endemicism. So they became endemic. They became local, locally adapted mammals, including humans. 
<clears throat> humans, the human lineage was basically trapped in sub-Saharan Africa, and that's where we evolved uh, from five million years to two and a half million years ago, which is the time period from, from Ardipithecus to early Homo. That's where it happened in Africa. But then after about two and a half million years or so, uh, climatic conditions changed. The far, I mean, the de deserts were vastly decreased in extent and bi-directional dispersals were possible. So whereas in the late Miocene, there was a more or less unidiversal, unidirectional, uh, sorry, dispersal of animals from Eurasia into Africa, after two and a half million years, it went both ways. And that's the time when humans start to leave Africa and invade Eurasia. Uh, this is another chart from that publication. Uh, there's a lot here, but basically what I want you to notice is that somewhere around seven to six million years ago, you get this massive migration or dispersal of all these different kinds of animals. These are all different sorts of uh, carnivores, including bear and a badger and some hyenas, hyenas, foxes, etc. And then giraffes, giraffes, which I mentioned before, giraffes are African, but no, they're not African. Giraffes are Asian and, and were present in, in Anatolia and were present in Greece and were present further north into places like Germany and Hungary. They are Asian. They move tribal cortex. These are these are antelopes um, of various sorts. And then this is porcupine. These are rabbits. These are animals that moved, that started out in Eurasia and moved into Africa as a consequence of climate, climate change over these long periods of time. And hominids are not special. They're doing the same thing that everybody else is doing. Everybody is moving south to find easier um, areas in which to live, which to find food. Hominids do the same thing. And they enter Africa from the Eastern Mediterranean, broadly speaking, at this same time period as well. At least that's the theory. We don't have any fossils to prove it yet. So finally, this is my own question to myself, I guess. Why does studying myasinix, or what does studying myasinix tell us about human evolution? Which is why I do it. I, I study myasinix and have been for more than 40 years now um, because I want, because I think it helps us to understand what happened, how we evolved, answer basic questions about us, which is what I'm most interested in. Um, in the Miocene, we see the first signs of things like increases in brain size, longer lifespans, and upright posture, things that we associate with being human. I think that having evolved in Europe and in the Eastern Mediterranean, Hominines were subjected to seasonal variations in climate, more challenging ecological conditions. They evolved in divert, they evolved, sorry, diverse strategies in both arboreal and terrestrial uh, habitats. And they evolved wide ranging diets from specialized full livery, highly specialized leaf eating which is characteristic of one kind of uh, Miocene ape from Europe, to specialized hard object feeding, which is characteristic, for example, of the, of the Racopithecus. <clears throat> the seasonal, seasonal challenges, including shortages uh, in the availability of food, which would force individuals, force people, force these individuals, rather, to look for other sources of food, which means selection for intelligence, the cognitive capability to, to survive in challenging circumstances, may have selected for enhanced cognitive abilities as well. So this is to summarize, big brains, enhanced cognition, 
a long lifespan and erect posture. Those are all the things that we see initiated in the Miocene, particularly in the late Miocene. Not developed to the point where they are in modern humans, but we see the initial stages of those things. So just to give you a few uh, points of information, uh, this is a chart of brain size relative to body size. And we see that monkeys uh, uh, have small brains compared with their body size. Apes have kind of intermediate brains. The apes are in these, uh, between these two dotted lines. They have bigger brains than, say, baboons of the same body size, but of course they're also larger in body size. But they're all in this region here. And the fossil apes that we find, like root, it's very rare to find one that's complete enough where we can actually say what the brain size was. And even then, we still have to estimate it. We have two specimens of Rudipithecus. That's, I'm holding one of them here to show you how small it was. Um, that's in this grade eight range, not in the monkey range, but in the grade eight range. Um, we don't know, this is the back of the skull of Anandalubius. It's got a pretty decent part of the brain case preserved. And I'm hoping that we're gonna be able to analyze it in more detail. I'm just guessing right now, but having looked at it just fairly recently with one of my students who's looking at brains, we think that it's this, well, just to give you the whole story, I have an endocast, I have a cast of a brain of a gorilla. <clears throat> so it's probably about a quarter the size of our brain, 400 cc's. Our brains are about 1,200 cc's. But I have this cast uh, in my lab, and it fits almost perfectly inside this little part here of the Santa Volubius brain case. That doesn't mean that Adam Louise had a brain of 400 cc's. That would be the size of an Australopithecine brain. That would be big. But it's probably not that far off. And we're going to look at more quantitative, scientifically rigorous ways of estimating the brain size of Adam Delubius. But I'm guessing that it's going to be, I'm sure it's going to be in the apes and it's going to be somewhere in the middle here. And that's interesting. At least that's our initial hypothesis. The first really undoubted hominid, human, human ancestor, Ardipithecus, that's what this is, is also in this ape brain. <coughs> it's only after about uh, three and a half million years to three million years ago that we start to get things that are just creeping above this ape region, which is Australopithecines that are a little bit higher up. And then, of course, this chart doesn't have it, but humans would be way, humans would be up here somewhere. <clears throat> anyway, the point is that in the Miocene, we start to see the indications of bigger brains. And of course, humans have the biggest brains in any primate. Uh, life history, so this means longevity, um, how long it takes to grow from birth to full adulthood, things like uh, how many offspring you're likely to have, um, a variety of things like that. So just to give you an example, um, chimpanzees, when, they, when their teeth erupt, um, uh, they have their milk teeth very, very early on, their first molars erupt at about three years of age, their second molars at about six, their third molars at about nine. Humans are twice as long, take twice as long. First molars at six instead of three, second molars at 12 instead of six, and third molars at 18 instead of nine. Twice as long. That's how long it takes us to grow. We are very, very slow growing organisms. But while we're growing, our brains are growing and we're absorbing information from our experiences. That's why that's so important. Well, you can actually look at the inside of a tooth and analyze how long it took for that tooth to grow. 
and see if it grew more at monkey rates, more at ape rates, or more at human rates. And these guys all grow at ape rates. So a slowing down of growth to ape rates as opposed to the faster growth rates of monkeys, which is a precursor to what we see with the extreme delay in maturation that we find in modern humans. <clears throat> and then finally, the last area that where the Miocene informs us about humans is an orthograding or erect posture. We go from things like this is another uh, Griffopithecus-like taxon uh, from Africa, was a generalized arboreal quadruped, like a monkey, basically, but without a tail. Um, Dan Eugius that I mentioned before, this early arboreal, <coughs> arboreal biped was an early orthograde, an early orthograde ape. with a vertebral column that was more vertically oriented, and it was an arboreal biped. Then you have Hispanopithecus, which is a contemporary of uh, Rudopithecus, but known from a, a fairly complete skeleton, very modern suspensory ape-like. So you got this transition from monkey-like to more orthograde, to orthograde and then highly suspensory, and then you have the Gracopithecus, represented by and a Delugius, which is more terrestrial, perhaps an early facultative biped, but we need the limb bones, we need to find those limb bones to test this hypothesis. But I'm guessing that that's what we'll find. And then of course, when you get to Artipithecus, you have a more evolved uh, facultative biped, very adept in the trees, but also quite well adapted to living on the ground. So this is, Anadolupius is centrally placed. This is how it helps us to understand this evolution from a more generalized quadruped to a more dedicated biped. So here are a summary of the questions that this bright young student asked me. What is Anadolupius? What came before Anadolupius? Why is Anadolupius important? Why did we become bipedal? Why did hominids move and took it to Africa, and what does studying, the last question is my own question, but what does studying my theory tell us about human evolution? So the answers are, to summarize, Anadolubius is a hominine, it's an African ape and human member. <coughs> it's not something outside of that group. It is related to things that are only present in Africa if you discount the modern human diaspora, of course. Uh, and it's probably close to the time when living African apes and humans split apart. It evolved from precursors in Europe that were ape-like in body form, brain size, growth, and probably behavior. And the Luvius tells us about the last common ancestor we share with African apes. It helps us to understand how and why we became bipedal from its anatomy and also the environment in which it lived. It lived. It also helps us to understand why hominines moved back to Africa as one of the last surviving great apes in the Mediterranean region. Miocene apes show us the early stages of the adaptations that define us as humans. I want to thank Professor Ayla Sedlimero for and her team for their remarkable work at Terracular over these many years and for inviting me participate in this research, and I'm honored to be a part of their research group. I noticed also that Toracular translates in English as wasteland, <laughs> according to Google Translate. Maybe somebody can give me a better definition. But if this is correct, I think we need to change the name to Amazing Fossils. <laughs> Thank you very much.